Good evening. It's Annabelle from Coffee Clutch again, and we're picking up our conversation about IR35 and you. Thank you for joining me. It's been quite a few interesting couple of weeks on the IR35 front, because while we're starting to educate you about how IR35 is today and the changes they're going to make, we had one really good piece of news in the budget, which was that the IR35 administration regime is not going to come in in April 2019, within a week of Brexit, which is probably a great relief. They're going to put that back till April 2020. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but it does mean we've got more than a year to get our ducks in a row. But of course, we need to get our ducks in a row now, because although the administration is changing, the basic rules have been in place for some time. So we've got a window to get ourselves sorted out before clients start sorting this out for us. IR35 in its original form is in force now. So there are some of us who are trading in a way that means technically we should be paying tax under the IR35 regime. Or we should be paying tax as employees if we don't have a limited company. So what IR35 is about is about taxing your turnover in a similar way to pay as you earn. Now, you don't have to have been in business very long to work out turnover isn't profit. And um, that can have a particularly bad effect. So the first thing we're going to do, well, not the first thing, but something we're going to do is go through the current test, because even if you're not subject to the public sector regime, you're going to be public um, subject to the changes when it comes into the private sector. We've bought a year by hassling. This isn't happening in April 2019. It's happening in April 20. 20 but i want to gently go through this with our groups over the years so you can change your business model if you need to to keep outside of this ambit and there are reasons for that because if you just uh, fiddle individual contracts to stay outside of it the, the revenue can go no 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 it's a dodgy arrangement so what we have to look at is your business model now what do i mean by your business model well it it's a big subject of business model. It's how you find your customers. It's your route to market. But in this context of tax, it's how you cost and deliver your services because there are ways to do it that will bring you inside IR35. There are ways to do it that will take you outside IR35. And you need to look at your business model because if you're going to be doing it in a way that brings you inside, that could result in a 30% withholding on your turnover. You need to make pretty sure that you are profitable enough cash flow wise to sustain that. So we've got 15 months to get there if that needs to be your plan. If you're self-employed um, and not running a company, you're going to have equivalent problems as a sole trader with getting on pay as you earn. Now, in April 2018, uh, we got a new administration regime for IR35 into the public sector. Up until that moment, if you should have been subject to IR35, it's your job to tell the tax man and pay up the tax. From April this year, in the public sector only, it was the client's job to decide whether this should have been done, and if so, to deduct it from you at source. There's no appeal against that decision. So if they got it wrong, tough on you. You've got a certificate that said 30% of your fee had been withheld. And the idea is you use that to pay your corporation tax at the euro. I don't know about you, though. My corporation tax is never equivalent to 30% of my turnover. So it's a massive withholding cash flow wise. And for a lot of people, it's caused major problems. In the public sector, according to surveys, um, something like 12% of public sector employees said, I'm not prepared to make unique assessments for everyone I pay. I'm just going to put everyone who's a sole trader on pay as you own, and everyone who's trading through a company, I'm going to deduct IR35 from. No right of appeal, nothing. If you want to work with them, that's what you do. The result of this was a massive exodus from the public sector into the private sector, a skill shortage, because a lot of contractors said, I don't want your contract if that's how it's going to work. And generally speaking, it not only created a labour shortage, but a 25% hike in uh, cost of contracts. 
which is not quite equivalent to the 30% withholding, but it's getting there. So the government in its wisdom said, right, we're going to stop people ducking and diving with this. We're going to roll out that regime. This is what we're talking about as IR35 changes into the, the private sector generally. And until the budget, this is what was proposed for April 2019. So in theory, at that point, and don't panic, we've had some developments, then anybody that you are invoicing through a company could go, do you know what? I don't want to play with this game. Um, I'm going to withhold 30%. Now, why would they do that? Well, we dealt with that in the previous webinar, but in overview, if they decide you shouldn't be subject to deductions and they get it wrong, they can be fined and they can pay interest. If they decide you should be subject to deductions and that's wrong, nobody gets hurt but you. Talking to people in the, the public sector, they've had to set up separate departments for people to keep vetting contracts. It's been a major mission. The temptation, of course, is just to make a blanket assessment or to do it really quickly. And this means we have got to get you very clearly trading in ways that allow you to make a profit if this happens or to very clearly put you outside of this in terms of your business model. We can't stop clients making the wrong decision. So there's a client piece to do as well there, but it's a big piece of work and this is the way of the future. So the April 2020 deadline has given us some breathing space. And what the budget told us was there's going to be a small business exemption. Now we're terribly excited about that, but it didn't mean a small business exemption from IR35. It appears to me a small business exemption from having to be the company that decides on whether deductions should be made. So if you are a, a tiny micropreneur and you're paying one VA, the chances are you won't have to make the decision about IR35. It doesn't mean that your tiny VA can't be told you should really be on payroll or you should be subject to deductions. We're not at all clear about that. We're waiting for clarity. The chances obviously not moving terribly quickly on this. So we think the small business exemption applies to the client, but not to the supplier, if you see what I mean. We will be keeping you posted on that. If that is the case, that will take tiny VA teams where VAs are paying other VAs out of the net of having to deduct at source. But it doesn't necessarily take a single VA out of the IR35 regime itself, which currently has no exemption. What level is the exemption going to be? Well, I don't know. Um, IPSI and other organisations are pushing to make it the same as the VAT threshold, but we don't know. But as soon as you know, as we know, you will know. So the important thing is to stay out of creating a relationship with your client that makes you a sitting duck for IR35. We went through this briefly again last time. Some of the tests are about control. We're going to do a lot more about that this time, about whether you can substitute and whether you are integral to the organisation. There are lots of other tests too, and we're going to do a lot more on that tonight. But the problem for a lot of VAs is that the they've let the client set the hours of when they work. Now, I know a lot of great VA coaches tell you not to do that, but if you've let the client say you will be available Mondays and Thursdays before lunch or whatever, you've just ticked the control box. Substitution is another problem. Although our contracts give you the right to substitute and we will be updating them progressively as we know what's going on. If the client has never in fact let you substitute, it's a problem because it's putting you in the control in the worker box if not in the employment box and that means the tax situation changes and indeed the whole thing about employment rights begins to change what I'm suggesting to you is that you make sure you have an associate that you can substitute that you keep records of your substitutions and you use the forthcoming Christmas and Easter holidays to start training your customers to accept a substitute if they've never done it before. I think we're going to do some webinars for your customers about why this is important. We're not going to leave you on your own for that. There's already a blog on the Coffee Clutch site about this, but if we can't get 
the customers to allow substitution, very many of you are going to fall into this trap. Now, integral is really whether the organisation relies on you. So um, we will be going through that in more detail. These are not the only tests, but these are the areas where VAs particularly tend to fall inside this by mistake. And anyone regularly attending the client premises for fixed hours has got a really big problem. So some of the things that we need to look at are retainers, because one of the things about retainer arrangements, as opposed to working by project or ad hoc, is there is an expectation of ongoing work. And this is one of the tick boxes. So you ask yourself the question, if I don't speak to my client today, and I make no arrangements during November, and I do the work I've been given, do I know I've got work in December? Because if you do, you've ticked one of the boxes. Now, don't panic about these things because the R35 test is a combination of things. But the more boxes you tick, the more likely you are to fall inside it. The next question that HMRC are very fussed about is who runs the risk of overruns? So if you're working on a fixed fee project, then you're running the risk of overruns. If you're working on a retainer arrangement where you just do the work and if it takes you twice as long tough on you, you're running it. But of course, many VAs work on the basis of extra time outside the retainer is more. So you wouldn't be able to tick the box of I run the risk of overruns if in fact, if the project takes more time, you charge more. Similarly, the risk of reworks. If for some reason the draft is no good, who pays for the time of redoing it? If it's the client, you are moving towards the R35 stroke employment box. If it is you, because you didn't do it right in the first place, you are moving away from it. So in order to get ready for IR35, some of the things I want you to do, and we'll come onto the test in a minute, is to start to really monitor your time not just because you're offering hourly rate services, but to begin to look at what can you offer as fixed fee, what can you offer as packages. There's a reason why it's a trend out there in the micropreneur world, and that is because packages and fixed fee do not a project-based work when you go to write your website will cost you X rather than so much an hour, so much a day, are much less likely to attract this kind of taxation. The other thing to be very careful about is doing work regularly on the client's premises. We all rock up for meetings, but if you're basically um, going there all the time regularly, you're ticking another box. Unending contracts are a problem because of the commitment to continuity. Now, the way we've set things up in our contractual system for you is you've got a framework agreement which is unending, and that doesn't matter because the bookings end. Now, you might think, well, if I could have an open-ended booking form that says I'm booked for the rest of my life, I've got a client for life. But that's just like having a job. And we need to start finding ways to work naturally and easily. I think about her attending once a month if it's, if it's a team briefing is fine. I'm really thinking about the VAs who go in and you see them advertised in the VA forums, needs to turn up on site three days a week, needs to sit on site and answer reception and calls. That is an issue because the inland revenue are definitely going to look at that um, as disguised employment. Now, what I'm going to suggest is um, that we go through some of these tests um, that the inland revenue go through because the answer to this is not what I think about this. It's what they think about it. Now, what I want to tell you is that the link I gave you in the last webinar is to a contractor website that is returning very accurate results. The link we are about to go through um, is the HMRC's one. I'm sorry to keep calling them in now, maybe I'm getting old. HMRC's website is fabulously inaccurate. For about 20% of people, it returns the wrong answer. And for another 40% of people, it returns an answer that's worse than useless because it basically goes, maybe, maybe not. However, this is the website your clients will be using if they want to find out whether they should be deducting from you. So it's a very good idea to get your arrangements in line with what this site throws up, even though you may be fine 
if it says you're not fine, because it's going to frighten the life out of your clients. So what are you going to say? Risk a fine and interest and don't deduct tax from me because I dispute HMRC's website. You can see that that's going to be a bit of a tricky thing. So I want to go through this with you. But what we're going to be doing um, is looking at over the year, how do you do more fixed fee? How more do you do more project work in, in a contractual sense? Um, and also, how do you get clarity on fixed fee and project works um, so that you don't go bankrupt? Because obviously you can't say, oh, we'll do an infinite number of hours for a finite amount of money. So we're starting a long project to show you how to use the contracts you've got. And if we need to modify them, you know we change them at no extra cost within your support period. Um, do not panic. We are starting with getting you understanding what you're doing, then thinking about what you need to do with clients. And we will be with you in the client support group going, this is what you need to do. Let's do it this way. This is what you need to change. Right. This is a bit like GDPR. When the early adopters on our GDPR programs came in 18 months ago, two years ago, some of them now, we were like, oh, but most of those people now, if you go talk to them about GDPR and you know who they are in our main customer group, even if you're not in one of our GDPR groups, we'll go, no, it's not a big problem. I check in when I've got an issue, but basically I know what I'm doing. My goal is to get you there for April 2020 with IR35. And I fully recognize that none of us are there now. And obviously they're consulting about changing the law, changing this, changing that. But my idea is that we do our basic audit now of where are you at risk? We look at what needs to be done about that and you make a plan that allows you as you renew contracts and take on new clients to understand what you're doing. And for those of you who watch this on Meplay, which I know is a large number of people, that is the mission to make you fluent in this because we need to survive and thrive in the gig economy. We do not need to be short paid 30%. So we can start to model some of these things um, in a useful way, I think. There will be changes, but just like GDPR, if you can get a map now of where are the dragons, then when they change things, when something happens, instead of us all going, oh, I can't cope with it, go, I know we had a plan for this, let's do it. And let's face it, we need a plan to hold on to our 30% wherever possible, don't we? A legal plan. Now, there's a world of difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. And the, the revenue do not like you gaming the system. So this has to be a natural part of your business model. Now, if at the end of the day, you, the way you naturally trade brings you within R35, do not game the system and start saying, I'm doing stuff, I'm not doing stuff. You just need to look at your pricing and cash flow. And again, we've got issues around that on the contracts to roll out next year to make sure that the amount of money you're actually getting is enough. So I'm in no way suggesting that we all go on a mass avoidance scheme, but I think you have to identify the risk. And then your plan could be to trade differently or to take account of IR35 in your pricing and payment structure. Don't panic. We've got you. After what they did to us with GDPR, and for those of you around before that with digital VAT, this is not so bad. It's just another lot of jargon, another lot of ideas, and you are going to become compliance business veterans. And if you happen to be VAs who do a lot of bookkeeping or VAs who do a lot of finance, this is a great thing to get your head around. But just like GDPR, don't start advising people you're inside IR35, you're outside, unless your insurance comes there, because it can be expensive when it goes wrong. So the link to the, um, the government site that we're going to be working on today, I am putting in the chat room. But what I'm going to try and do, because I'm not very good at this, is to do a screen share and do a dummy one for a typical VA. So this is where we are going to educate them. We're going to work out what triggers everybody. And hopefully that's what we're going to do. But we're going to come back to that. Now, I've given you the link to the page so you can do this in your own time. But I'm going to take you through my imaginary VA contract with my imaginary VA. So I'm going to go to this page and you can read in your own time all this stuff because this is where your clients will come and this is where you can come. So. You can check it as a worker providing a service. You can check it as a person hiring them or an agency. Now, we don't have any agencies in our group as far as I know. 
the, the difference is if the client checks it and, and these answers really reflect what's going on, they can get a little certificate at the end that says they don't have to deduct IR35. If you check it, it's not valid, it's just indicative. So I'm going to do it as the end client, um, but I'm not going to get right through to the end. And I'm going to look at my VA on a retainer and I'm going to make some very common um, decisions. Now, I'm going to do this as the end client because this is what your client's going to do. You can model it as the worker if that makes it easier for you. So here's me and I've taken on a VA and she has not yet started. These are the questions that I have to answer. Now, a lot of my VAs are limited uh, companies, so I'm going to go that route. Now, these are the really important questions and you can go through them at your leisure. Will the worker or their business perform office holder duties? So that means like being on the board or being a trustee or something like that. And for the vast majority of VAs, the answer is going to be no. Um, you, it's a really unusual thing to be saying yes. If you think the answer to that should be yes, let me know what you're doing because it would be unusual for a VA to be a director of the client organisation. You get some accountants doing that and, and various other people. Is the worker's business um, said someone else? Um, would you be able to substitute? This is a substitution clause we were talking about earlier. Now, this is where it gets tricky. You see this little bit here, we need to know what was happening in practice, not just what it says in the worker's contract. Now, with existing contracts, obviously, if you can show that you have substituted this Christmas or Easter just for holiday cover, even if you put someone up who didn't do anything, if a substitute was engaged and you were prepared to pay them if they did something, this would be a very useful thing. This is a big sticking point with most of our customers because they don't want a substitute, right? So I'm going to say, and this is true, right? Um, we, we actually say in our contracts they won't be unreasonably refused. Um, and so I'm going to say um, I would meet the substitute who met the criteria. If your clients tick the other box, you get a very different result. Would my VA pay the VA substitute? Yes, they would. I would get another one and use them instead. This is really important. Out of IR35. You can see that by simply allowing a substitute and the VA paying it for themselves, you get straight out. If, on the other hand, you're not allowed to substitute, so let's suppose you were a world-class opera singer and nobody would want me instead of Pavarotti. So it wouldn't make any difference that the substitution was there. Well, I have this problem as a speaker in the nicest possible way. If you book me to speak, most people don't want someone else. So not all businesses allow substitution. So what you have to do is model how yours is really working. So I'm not going to take hours of your time and go, what if substitution isn't allowed? What is? But what I want you to do as part of this project is to use that test for your biggest contracts, the way they work today or the commonest way, you know, because we all work in more than one ways and see what you're getting. As we're all in business, I'm taking it that most of us want to be in business and we do not want to be dragged back into um, the hybrid space. There's a massive argument going on about that um, in terms of tax and workers' rights in the gig economy. And I don't, I don't want to give you a headache about the various 98,000 proposals that people have put forward. But at the moment, you would be in the invidious situation if you were taxed under IR35 of being taxed almost as if you were an employee with none of those legal rights. So, what I want you to do is to complete that as the work of, or do it as an imaginary client for the arrangements that you're uh, actually, you know, looking at for your business model. And um, you can check back what your answers were and why. Um, and you you can actually, if if you're getting the right result, the client can do it. 
and get a little thing that says, no, this is a valid arrangement. The problem is if the boxes that are ticked don't match what you're really doing. Now, what I want you to bear in mind is the R35 test is per contract. So I could have two contracts, one that came out self-employed and one that came out IR35, right? Because we do work in different ways. So as a speaker, I've got more risk of, of being a worker, which is a hybrid in the middle, because they won't accept a substitute. As me doing this tonight, um, now, what we've got to do is to make sure that the way you work keeps being tested against that because HMRC will from time to time amend the test because that's what your client's going to do. Most of us have been going forward on the basis that if we say we're self-employed, we are. If the contract says we're self-employed, we are. But there are customers we know we have in, in our customer group who if they do this test will fail. So I'm not asking everyone to do it publicly. And I know already some of the people on the uh, previous webinar got some very great results that we need to work on. And those were... Um, people who weren't allowed to substitute because if you reverse the answers that you just did and put in you're not allowed to substitute or it's very restricted all the other factors will come into play and you can get the opposite result now the risk that we run at client goes i don't want to substitute fills in the wrong answer now they're deducting your 35 from you what we've got to do is check out the results Ask ourselves whether the clients really fill in those results. We've got to start training clients to accept substitutes, basically. Uh, not all the time, but I think our campaign might be high days and holidays. Now, most of my regular VA teams, by the way, do offer me substitutes for Christmas and holiday. I don't find it an issue. I don't use them very much, but I'm quite determined with mine to do an hour of each over Christmas and make a record of it. Um, to be sure we need to start educating the clients because if they're going to imagine this you invoice a client 100 quid and they pay you 70 quid and a tax certificate now go down to tesco's and tell them i want to pay my grocery bill with a tax certificate it's not working is it we are pushing very very hard to get the thresholds up and to make this easier on everyone but i'm never optimistic about how much sense the government is making so we're also pushing you gently to go check whether you're within scope because what's changing in april 2020 is whether the client has to figure this out if you come out as in scope now you're in scope now and you should be taxed that way so you need to move forward with that you need to be very very careful about these ongoing retainer arrangements with no substitution allowed and you, you definitely want to start sorting them out be very careful for regular attendance at the client's premises and watch the control test now i don't know if you want to do this again without the substitution but when you start going well maybe substitute maybe not all these other questions come up and you'd be surprised how quickly you end up with probably IR35. So, yeah, you should be self-employed. I think we're all entrepreneurs. I don't think we've got any customers, unless I'm mistaken, who actually really wanted a job and actually are just invoicing as another way of having a job. Most of our customers are born entrepreneurs, love you all, love what you do, love how you thrive. And that's where you want to be. And we want to support you staying there. So if you get into the habit of doing this test when you start a new arrangement, checking it out from time to time. If you start getting in the grey zone, get hold of me. Um, we also will be slightly changing the contracts in the new year to say to the client, you mustn't refuse a suitably qualified substitute. But for some of them, that's going to be a real problem. One of the things I've been thinking of doing, and I mean, again, it's up to the group. We do a lot of webinars about the legal issues of being a VA, but we've never really done one about the legal issues of having a VA. And I'm wondering whether, I mean, I'm absolutely sure that anyone who's using our terms, as you can see, it's quite easy to pass all these tests. It's getting it straight. But we've got a lot of clients who know nothing about it. And yeah, is there something we can do to start to educate the end client? Because if the client says, I mean, one of the things you could do is say, I've arranged 
Jane Doe to be on call the following days as a substitute for me because I'm having this time off over Christmas. To what extent would a client go, how dare you? I mean, they can say they're not calling, but you've arranged a substitute, haven't you? Now, for some clients, that would be fine. I think I did it with Jenny when she was away over the summer. Um, she said, I've got some substitute on who's up for urgent work, and I think I emailed her about a couple of things. I didn't email as much as I would have done with my normal VA in place because there's too much explaining to do, isn't there? But for me, that was adequate. For another client, that would totally freak them out, wouldn't it? You guys need to get going with, well, what exactly could I do that would start to build this record? Because I don't think you're going to have... Um, it's difficult with special category data. Yes, it is. And this is why the... Contracts we did for GDPR, I'll say it myself, took a lot of time and effort because what we've done is we've controlled the data, not the people. So what you do when you organise a substitute is remember the data processing form you and your client filled in because of VBA terms. You give that to your substitute. You do back-to-back -back contracting, so they are bound by the same terms in terms of data processing that you are. And of course you're using hopefully our VA hiring agreement <coughs> or equivalent, which is absolutely full of confidentiality clauses. Now, not all of, even a client who has a lot of special category data doesn't have only special category data, <coughs> excuse me. So you might have a health related client who does um, a lot of stuff that you really couldn't share, but you might be able to get a VA to do one mailing. Now you've substituted. You don't have to substitute everything you do. You have to substitute something you do, and there has to be a record that you paid that VA. Now, obviously, that affects your profitability if you're paying a VA to do something. You could perfectly well do yourself. But if you're growing your business and you're getting to the edges of capacity anyway, if you start to get little bits of substitution into the clients you service, you are building that business structure. Does that make sense? And yes, the government has made it very difficult by insisting we control data for GDPR, but not individuals for R35. And if I say it myself, I think we did an amazing job by creating a data control system that didn't control individuals. But... It did nearly kill me, so I'm hoping that they don't do another spanner in the works. Um, but yes, it is difficult. And, you know, you might have to spin it all down. Um, I think everybody should be looking for a kind of substitute buddy of someone who you can trust to do the low end bits um, and, and keep a record. And that's going to take time because don't forget the test is not can you substitute you have to be able to show if challenged that you have so if you tick that box and you've got no record of substitution that result can be invalidated so it's kind of finds a budget time i think so you know what you're doing you're testing the contracts using this one and you're going to come back and we're going to start paving the way for substitution and that means Properly contracting your VA, yes, it does. Um, sorting out the GDPR side of things and beginning to set up a system where you have substituted and you can show that you have. Now, substitution is not the only way to demonstrate that you're truly self-employed, but the lack of substitution makes you go through all the other tests. So if you can do it with substitution, it's an easy one. If you can't do it, go back through those tests and say, I'm not allowed to substitute and see what you get. With that happy thought, I'm off to think about IR35, contemplate the nature of GDPR in a post-Brexit world and get on with life and universe and everything. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. See you back in the room. <laughs> Bye.